name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight is class 30 of our Orthodox Survival Course. We're still going through the book on nihilism by Father Seraphim Rose. And uh, in our last class, we dealt with, we were still on chapter <clears throat> two, the stages of the nihilist dialectic, and we had covered the first, first three stages, liberalism, realism, and vitalism. And tonight, we're going to finish chapter two, with stage four, the nihilism of destruction, the logical end of the whole process, and go on to chapter three, the theology and spirit of nihilism. So chapter three, section four, the nihilism of destruction. In the book, this is pages 54 to 58. Having so thoroughly discussed the first three stages of nihilism, the author has little work left in order to state what is the only possible next step of the progress from liberalism to realism to vitalism, which is total destruction. Liberalism relativizes all truths. Realism reduces truth to disconnected material phenomena. And then vitalism says, oh, forget truth altogether. Just exercise your will and maximize your passions. So once the vitalist's passions and will have been exhausted on vainly pursuing some kind of a good, all that is left is the destruction of all goods, all values, the flight or the, the fall into the abyss, total destruction. Paragraph one of this section, the author points out that this, the, this is really unprecedented. What's going on here is unprecedented. Of course, widespread destruction and men glorying in destruction have always existed. Okay? Destructive people and destructive behavior has always existed. But today, there is an unprecedented doctrine and plan of destruction, a stated overt philosophy, a glorying in destruction, a statement that the destruction is, the, is their goal, that, that it's their ultimate purpose. And who are these apostles of destruction? We can call them the nihilist theorists, which is covered in paragraphs 2 to 4 of the section, or pages 55 to 56 of the book. Even the so-called restrained nihilists, the, the realists and vitalists, did advocate the destruction of the old order the order based on the church, based on monarchy, based on uh, the family, and so forth, and the abolition of absolute truth. Remember that in our earlier classes, uh, we summarized the author, Father Seraphim's thought about the realists and vitalists in, which, vitalists in which he demonstrated that they are indeed forms of nihilism. The author uses as the model of these so-called restrained nihilists the character of Bazarov in Turgenev's Fathers and Sons. Bazarov is a realist. He believes in science or scientism. But he states that there is not a single institution of our society that should not be destroyed. If you really want to get depressed, just read Turgenev. That's, he's portraying the, the, the society of his time and, and the, the cynicism and the, the dark character of the, the aristocracy, aristocracy intelligentsia of his society. The open apostles of absolute destruction include Friedrich Nietzsche, of course, a Russian named Sergei Nechayev, and a Russian named Mikhail Bakunin. Nietzsche, as we have already seen, proclaimed that there is no truth. All is permitted. Bakunin, in his revolutionary catechism, says that, quote, our task is terrible, total, inexorable, and universal destruction. They just come right out and say it. Destruction, destruction, that's it. Our task, he says. In his reaction in Germany, he writes, let us put our trust in the eternal spirit which destroys and annihilates only because it is the unsearchable and eternally creative source of all life. This is really devil talk, right? <laughs> the, an eternal spirit that destroys and annihilates and because it's the, the creative source of life. It's destruction. So this is just a, a demonic, right, a obsessed mind talking here. The passion for destruction is also a creative passion. They believe they're creating. Of course, this is not creative. This is anti-creation, right? They can't really create. So it's an anti-creation. It's the choice of Satan. When asked what he would do if his new order came into existence, Bakunin replied, then I should at once begin to pull down everything I had made. It's kind of like a spoiled child, a little, little boy playing with blocks, you know, and he builds something and he knocks it down. He builds something and he knocks it down just for the sheer pleasure of knocking it down. And, but that's the, the, it's that, that childish impulse, but now taken to a, you know, being proclaimed by adults as being their, their religion, basically, for all society. Now, to bring this up to date, to, to, to show that this thinking is, is still with us, it is widely known now that the men in charge of American foreign policy who make the decisions about our, what wars the United States undertakes or what, our, what the United States relationship is to other governments and so forth, the foreign policy of the United States, that the men in charge of this since, really since the 1990s um, are called neocons or neoconservatives. And who are these people? The first generation of them were Trotskyites. They were actually non-Christian men 
uh, originally from Europe, who were really Trotskyist Marxists. But they just when but but mysteriously they transmuted themselves into cons so-called conservative Republicans. And uh, when the political winds shifted in the U.S. towards so-called conservatism, now one of their leading thinkers is a man named Michael Ledeen. And most of us Orthodox have never heard of this person, probably. But in American political thought, he's very well known. Michael Ledeen, he's a, a considered a, a mainstream so-called conservative writer, and he's been he's been funded by you know, uh, so-called conservative groups like the American Enterprise Institute and so forth. And he wrote a book in 2002 on the so-called war on terror. And this is his famous statement in that book. Creative destruction is our middle name, both within our own, both within our own society and abroad. We tear down the old order every day, from business to science, literature, art, architecture, and cinema, to politics and the law. Our enemies, our enemies, have always hated this whirlwind of energy and creativity which menaces their traditions, whatever they may be, and shames them for their inability to keep pace. Seeing America undo traditional societies, they fear us. They do not wish to be undone. They cannot feel secure as long as we are there for our very existence. Our existence, not our politics, threatens their legitimacy. They must attack us in order to survive, just as we must destroy them. We must destroy them to advance our historic mission. There's a lot of devil talk in here. Mm -hmm. now, okay, now this is a man who's influential in making American policy. And he's just one among a whole cabal of these terrible people who have now who've basically taken over the American State Department and military, military, long-term military thinking. Right? And this is, their, this is their creed. This is their policy. We want to go around the world destroying everything not everything. Uh, traditional. Existing tra yeah, destroying traditional societies. Now, that doesn't just include the Muslims. These are the same people who want to destroy, who destroyed Yugoslavia, want to destroy the Ukraine, who want to, imp who want to export abortion, pornography, and the, the worst disgusting excesses of so-called American culture, so-called American, because as an American, I refuse to call that American culture. It's somebody else's culture that they've imposed on us. They've created and poisoned us with, right? But this, so this is exactly a nihilist spirit, how it's been, and, and the fact that they call it conservatism just shows what liars they are, right? How they can, they can flip or any kind of a term, they can, it's newspeak, right? They can invent any kind of, any kind of a meaning for anything that they want. So in other words, America's mission is to destroy all existing societies and traditions in every aspect. Now that's been defined as America's mission. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? A perpetual mission of never-ending destruction. It's nihilism. This is simply nihilism, and it's a very active, aggressive form. Okay? So nihilism is with us, and it's in the halls of power. And it's not only in the so-called leftist Democratic Party, it's also in the so-called conservative Republican Party. Okay? These are the people in power. Okay? So it's very much with us. So these are the... So um, I mentioned Michael Ledeen because he's a... Uh, Did they define the historic mission anyway? The historic mission is to run around destroying all tradition and, that's it. and constantly make new stuff up. And he says not only abroad but also here in America, and they have, right? They've destroyed everything tradition, or they're in the process of destroying everything traditional here and putting their own, you know, anti-Christian, anti-culture, anti-everything in, in its place. Right. So um, it's it's a uh, really evil. Really, uh, these are these are really these are people responsible for bombing Yugoslavia, for invading Iraq, beating the drums constantly for war, destroying Libya, murdering Gaddafi, uh, the nonsense going on in Syria, Ukraine right now, sponsored by supposedly this quote-unquote America, but not really America, but these parasites have taken over America. Okay. These, are, these people are nihilists. Okay. They, they're in love. they have a demonic love of destruction. They can't create anything good or beautiful or true. They can only destroy, and they glory in destruction. And they really hate Christianity. They, the, the, under the cloak of war and terror on Islam, what they really hate, uh, the Christians. They really, they really hated the Christians. <clears throat> because you see in the Middle East, they gladly partner with people who hate Christians, whether Jews or Muslims. See? And, they, and they go about destroying the societies that have harbored the Christians, like in Iraq and in Syria, the Christians were safe. And those are precisely the ones they chose to destroy. See? So what they, they hate Christ. They hate good, they hate the true, they hate the beautiful, they hate God. They hate the real God. Okay. So who are the agents of destruction? 
We talk about the ideologues of destruction, the prophets of destruction. Father Seraphim now brings up the agents of destruction, going back to the 19th century. This is paragraphs 5 and 6, pages 56, 57. The logical thing to do, if you are a convinced nihilist, is either kill yourself or murder other people, or both. And if you really believe in nihilism, then the logical thing to do is go around killing people, and maybe kill yourself. The 19th century anarchists, whom Father Seraphim calls by their real name, just assassins, they're just murderers, right? They murdered men of high rank who held authority in the old order sanctioned by the church and throne. We think of the, think of the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, the assassination of the Grand Duke um, Sergius, who was the husband of St. Elizabeth, the Grand Duchess, and so forth, uh, and on and on. These, the assassination of uh, King Alexander Karadziodrovich in the 1930s in Marseille, and, so, and on and on. Right? So the 19th century assassins were just, as, they were doing targeted assassinations of important people, right? But the 20th century assassins, or the murderers, starting with Lenin, murdered people of every rank, every station, on a vast scale, right? Murdering over 100 million people. They think Mao murdered 90 million of his own people. We think the Soviets, 60 million there. We don't know how many in Romania, Hungary, on and on and on. We don't know how many, right? Now, to bring this up to date, the current toll of the abortion slaughter of the innocents, starting in the 1970s, is conservatively estimated at 1 billion. And that's just in America and Europe. We don't, and Russia, we don't know. Africa, Asia, we don't even know. Okay? So that's more than all the known wars in history combined. If you take all the statistics that we can, of course, uh, it's hard to reconstruct ancient wars, but, if, but the best guess we can take, it's, it's less than, than, than the, the children killed in abortion. The stated goals of the scientific planners, H.G. Wells, Bertrand Russell, Jonas Salk, the father of vaccinations, Bill Gates, for example, his stated goals, uh, for the, the things that he's funding, or people like George Soros and so forth. They include reduction of IQ, destruction of the traditional family, and massive population reduction. Okay? These people are simply mass murderers. They're called visionaries, they're called planners, they're called philanthropists, but they're simply mass murderers. Okay? If you love God and you love other people, you don't do things like this. You don't plan and execute things like this. This kind of behavior can only come from unbridled worship of s the self, of self-will the will to power, very well exemplified in Ledeen's insane quote that I just read, right? It's the will to power, which is ultimately the worship of Satan. Okay. Though some like to think that the murderous aspect of nihilism is only at the extremes, our author, Eugene Rose, asserts that complete destruction is a fulfillment of the aim of all nihilism. There's no such thing as a moderate nihilist. <laughs> That's a contradiction in terms of moderate nihilist. <laughs> People are always saying, well, he's just a moderate communist, or he's just a moderate you know, like leftists or moderate this or that, you know, yeah, how do you, how do you control the satanic, right, the mod moderate nihilist? So let's summarize the stages of nihilism by this analogy Father Seraphim uses of spiritual blindness. Quoting St. John of Kronstadt on man's sinful soul being like a diseased eye which cannot see properly. Father Seraphim formulates this analogy of blindness to describe the progress of the four stages of nihilism. So liberalism says, we're not sick. My eye isn't sick. I'm not sick. I'm great. There's no such thing as original sin, in other words. My eye isn't sick. Our eye is sound. We don't need the physician, the church. We can see things as they really are. We can build a beautiful world based on values, based on humanism, right? without believing in revelation, without believing what God has revealed about to us. And then the next stage, the realists, or the, the, the scientistic ideologues, narrow the vision. They take that they take that disease vision. Like you know what happens? You know kind of when the when the when the vision gets narrowed to a tiny part of the eye, right? Distant objects, distant objects like mind or eternal truths or ideals or principles become impossible to see. All they can see are facts, phenomena, empirical data. Nothing else exists. So they go from claiming the eye is not sick to narrowing the vision to just things that are really up close, just little facts, right? Then vitalism creates distortions and hallucinations, so the person's really seeing things aren't even there. Okay? And the destructive nihilism, the last stage, is total blindness. And this disease in the eye spreads to the whole organism and results in corruption and death. Okay? That's the end of chapter 2, the stages of nihilism. Chapter 3, the theology and spirit of nihilism. Pages 59 to 73. Section 1, rebellion, the war against God. This chapter has two sections, one long section, rebellion, the war against God, and one short section, the worship of nothingness. So now the author says it's time to deal directly with the spiritual and theological aspect of nihilism. 
It is a spiritual problem. We're going to deal with it. We're going to talk about the th so-called theology of nihilism. In paragraphs 2 to 5, he, he comes around to Nietzsche's famous God is dead pronouncement. Of course, Nietzsche's famous pronouncement that God is dead is the first dogma of the theology of nihilism. What it means is not, of course, that God is dead, for God cannot die. What it means is that man has killed God in his heart. He not, hasn't just lost his faith, he's killed his faith. He's purposely killed it. Right? Now, the masses have simply apostatized to worldliness. That's why spiritual things just don't make an impression on them. The masses are not actively opposed to the faith, they're just indifferent, right? That, so that indifference has killed God in their heart. It's like someone who's just, you fall out of love with your spouse. Just neglect, your heart becomes cold, there's no more love. And that's the way people, the great masses of the formerly Christian people deal with God, with our God, right? So they've killed God just by indifference, kill God in their hearts. But the conscious, overt nihilists, the, the Bakunins, the Michael Adines, whoever, they purposely rejected God and they've turned to Satan on purpose. Okay? The leaders, of the, the elites, right? the people who make, are making these policies, making these decisions, creating these wars and gathering all the wealth to themselves and all that, they, they've purposely rejected God. They, they love Satan. Okay? God is dead means that man, either passively or actively, does not wish for God to exist. He knows God exists. Deep down, everybody knows that. They, everyone knows somewhere deep in their hearts that the real God exists, but these people, they don't want him to exist. They're mad. They're angry that he exists. Right? Section C, what, what I call section C, is paragraph 6 to 8, and I've labeled it not agnosticism or atheism, but rather anti Theism. Nihilists are not agnostics. They don't claim not to know. Okay? They are not merely atheists, those who say there is no God of any kind. They are not mere secular materialist unbelievers. Serious people know that, that um, so-called atheists like Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens are just not serious. They, they're not serious people. They, they, the thought is extremely superficial. Right? Okay. Proudhon, for example, another 19th century ideologue of, of nihilism and anarchist, Proudhon, Proudhon, for example, declares himself not an atheist, but an anti-theist. He hates God. He says, I hate God. The Christian God is there, and I hate him. He wants actively to hunt down the idea of God in the heart of man and destroy it. Quote, humanity must be made to see that God, if there is a God, is the enemy. Camus, in the 20th century, says clearly that rebellion, not unbelief, is the first principle. Not, unbelief, not just mere unbelief. Oh, I can't believe. Oh, I can't believe. That's just the, that's the cop-out of a worldly... Superficial person, oh, I can't believe, I don't believe in God. You know? But these serious nihilists say, no, we're, we're in rebellion, we're in revolt. We, we don't just don't believe in God, we hate God, we're, at, we're, we're his enemies. One recalls the words of St. James in his epistle. He's saying to a Christian, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So he's saying the devils know that there is a God, and they tremble, they're, they're anxious, right? they're, they're angry, they hate God. So these men, these anarchists, these nihilists, have become like devils. They know who the real God is, and they choose to fight him. These are, these are men acting like devils. Right? Revolutionary regimes, since the French Revolution, always institute a cult of some kind. It's always a cult. Of the supreme being of Robespierre. Right? Or if we look at, in the communist years, right, in the communist countries, especially in the Soviet Union, big processions with big pictures of Lenin and the cult of the mummified linen and all this. There's always a cult of some kind. They're, they're really replacing the true faith with some other kind of a faith. Or as I've said often in American culture, you know, these ritual, the, the, to, the, the two sacraments of, the, of nihilism in America, and now they've spread to the whole world through this process Michael Ledeen is glorifying, are abortion and homosexuality, infanticide and sodomy, infant sacrifice and sodomy. Those are their two sacraments. And anything, anything that touches that, anything that, that attacks that, they go wild, right? They go crazy trying to destroy anyone who challenges either of these two, their two sacraments. Okay? They just go insane. The character assassination, um, pro, you know, all, every, every possibly dirty, dirty trick in the book to destroy anyone, any, any cause, any person, any organization, any church that really actively fights their, their sacraments, right? So there's always a cult of some kind. Or um, another form of, uh, of the cult of nihilism in so-called American, or really just contemporary culture, and it's spread to the whole world, are these rock concerts, which are really Dionysian initiation experiences, right? Are, are these, these um, massive sporting events where it's really a ritual. 
you know, you go in and there's certain music and there's this dancing by half-naked cheerleaders and then there's the gladiatorial game. It's all, they're worshiping their God, right? They don't know, I mean, most of them don't realize that. They just think they're having a quote-unquote a good time, but they're really, they're worshiping their God, okay? So there's always some kind of worship of the new God, right? This is not just the absence of, of the true God. This is replacing the true God with false God or gods, the demons. Right? So theoretical atheism, I mentioned like Dawkins and people like that. This is childish. It's easily refuted. It's philosophical garbage, right? Nihilist anti-theism is not defeated by arguments. It is not an argument. It's not a theory. It's a fervent, impassioned hatred of God. It's demonic power. That's what we're dealing with. Okay? When we think of Lenin, Lenin's on his deathbed saying, bring me more death warrants. Bring me more death warrants. Well, he's, as he's dying, he's, he, couldn't, he couldn't sign the death warrants fast enough, order executions of people. He couldn't, couldn't do it fast enough as he was dying. Obviously, this is demonic possession, right? So what's the nature of the nihilist faith? Section D, I call section D, paragraphs 9 to 13, pages 63 to 64. Nihilism is not lack of faith. It is faith in something else. It aims not simply to destroy, but to replace the Christian faith as the true faith. Paragraph 10 is very important of this section. I'd like to re reproduce it in full. Here are the author's words. Quote, We have seen Christian faith to be the spiritual context wherein the questions of God, truth, and authority became meaningful and inspired consent. Nihilist faith also is similarly a context, a distinctive spirit which underlies and gives meaning and power to nihilist doctrine. The success of nihilism in our time has been dependent upon and may be measured by the spread of this spirit. Its arguments seem persuasive not to the degree that they are true, but to the degree that this spirit has prepared men to accept them. In the Christian era, when the church was the, the, the greatest influence in society, right? the Christian spirit, the, the, literally the Holy Spirit, the grace of God, the, inner, the, the, the saving energies of God influenced all the aspects of society. So people were prepared Right, to accept the truths of the faith. They were conditioned to accept the truths of the faith by the grace of God. Right? But with this great apostasy now, the dominant energies and spirit in most institutions, in most societies, among most people, are these demonic, this demonic spirit. And it, it predisposes people to accept nihilist, quote-unquote, doctrine, no matter how foolish or how destructive it is. In paragraph 11, the author defines the nature of nihilism as the dissatisfaction and rejection of things as they are. Remember, God created everything and said it is good. The nihilist looks at, at everything God created and says it's bad. We hate it. Okay. It's pure rebellion, pure revolt. Bakunin calls it, quote, the sentiment of rebellion, the satanic pride, which spurns subjection to any master or whatever, whether of divine or human origin. And he's praising it. Right? Bakunin is saying this is good, this is, or this is my good. Right? No matter how much the apologists of nihilism like to give it positive meaning, they call it freedom. Remember, it's always called freedom. Freedom! Like with the abortion thing, reproductive freedom, independence, throwing off constraints. We're not oppressed anymore. We're free. They cannot avoid the reality that its power comes from Satan. They say it does. <laughs> it was in, their, in their honest moments, they say it's from Satan. It's based on Satan's primal negation of everything good and true. The, I will not serve. Satan's first, you know, his rebellion, non serviam, I will not serve. The nihilist rejection then is not mere loss of faith. It's hatred of God. God is to be overthrown. Man must sit upon the throne. Of course, it isn't going to be man. It's going to be someone else. That's what Satan always tells people. Oh, you're going to be. What did he tell our first parents? You are going to be God. Section E, the nihilist con content for the old institution. Now, this is important because actually, when the nihilists really go about their work, they actually don't, they don't literally destroy everything. What they destroy is the inside of everything because they can't function. You can't really have pure anarchism where nothing works, right? Because then they would get killed too. Right? They would, if there was really true chaos, total chaos in society, no institutions, no structures, no rules, they would get, they would get destroyed too. So what they, what, they, what they really do is they become parasites. And they hollow out all the institutions and put nihilistic content into the existing institutions. Right? So it's essential to note that the real goal of nihilism is not necessarily the physical destruction of the outward institutions. Or if there is, that's a, that's a passing stage. Right? Or the complete rejection of the old doctrines but hollowing them out, replacing them with nihilist content and nihilist spirit. Like Michael Ledeen, he's a nihilist, right? But he's sitting pretty, making lots of, getting, getting money from American uh, benefactors and, and, and wearing nice clothes and living in a nice house, right? 
and and being part of the American power structure, right? So they they don't literally destroy everything. They take their satanic spirit. They hollow out the inside of of the traditional or the Christian structures, and they replace it with their satanic content. You cannot actually have nothing. You have to have something. <laughs> but they will fill the something with their spirit. Everything is to be reinterpreted. Remember Orwell's Newspeak, War is Peace, right? Falsehood is truth, so forth and so on. This passion for reinterpretation is the psychology of the Christian apostate, as well as the Bolshevik. Everything is reinterpreted. Yes. The nihilist program is to, re to revolt against divine authority, replaces all of the first principles of every institution discipline with its own. They come in, they take over every, every institution, whether it's the government, academia, the church itself, and they replace, they reinterpret everything with their own definitions and replace it with their own spirit, replace the Holy Spirit with their own spirit. It is the very first principles of these disciplines, and the, I'm quoting paragraph 18 in full. It is the very first principles of these disciplines and no mere remote or faulty applications of them that nihilism attacks. They say, oh, we're just attacking abuses. We're attacking oppression. No, no, no. They're attacking the very first principles of all, all the traditional institutions. The disorder, so apparent in contemporary... Now, he's writing 1960, 1962. <laughs> Imagine what he would think now. The disorder, so apparent in contemporary politics, religion, art, and other realms as well, is the result of the deliberate and systematic annihilation of the foundations of authority in them. Authority that was based on the real, right, right on God's truth. Unprincipled politics and morality, undisciplined artistic expression, indiscriminate so-called religious experience... All of the direct consequence of the application to once stable sciences and disciplines of the attitude. The application of what? The attitude of rebellion. We're going to destroy it all and replace it with our, you know, our father Satan's uh, principles. Now in the next couple of paragraphs he points out that resistance to nihilism is feeble and ineffective. The spirit of nihilism has entered so deeply into the fiber of our age that all resistance is feeble and ineffective. T.S. Eliot in his famous poem calls uh, modern man the hollow men. No strength, right? no will for the good. It won't take action. Renaissance, enlightenment, and liberal man had the illusion that he was still somehow noble and high-minded. Post-liberal man is disillusioned from this illusion. He doesn't pretend to be noble or high-minded. But instead of returning to the truth, he goes further into revolt against it. Right? He's just indifferent. Right? Most people just want their, their beer and their football at this point. Right? They're the hollow men. And then the, the actual ideologues, the, act, the, the people, the movers and, sh and shakers are in open revolt. The French writer Camus, for example, finds revolt as normal for the natural man. That's man's natural state, revolt against God. Of course, he's right. It's original sin. If you, call the, if you define the natural state not as the truly natural, but as original sin, it is. Without God, yes. Without grace, yes. Man's natural state is in, to be alienated from God. And now they've so succeeded in brainwashing everyone, that to everybody, the old order, the world dominated by the, by the church and her teachings, is a horrible memory of some dark past, which man has been liberated. You talk to students now who come out of university, they have no concept of real history. They just, they, at one time, there are these evil, dark people of kings and bishops and people like that who oppressed women and had slaves and um, killed darker races or whatever. It's just a mishmash of nonsense. They have gender identity. Uh, they can't know history. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Gender identity. They, they forced you to think you were a man or a woman. How horrible. You know, how oppressive, right? We were oppressed. So if you look back for the past 200 years, modern history is the chronicle of the overthrow of all traditional and legitimate authority. All the authorities in the world today are anti-authorities, right? The masses are conditioned to accept the nihilist interpretation of all recent history and know nothing about anything before their own time. Remember... A couple of classes ago, we talked about um, chronological provincialism, where people are locked in their own time. There was a, a writer uh, uh, named Christopher Lash. Uh, he was a uh, Harvard-educated, I think. I, th I think he taught at Northwestern. I forget where he taught, University of Chicago or Northwestern. He wrote a book in the '70s um, called the um, I think it was called "The Culture of Narcissism: American Life in an Age of Diminishing Expectations." I think the very first chapter, he said, the mark, one mark of the nar narcissist personality is that it's locked in its own time. He doesn't think about the past or the future. So the people like this, are, they're completely stunted, right? They have no, no concept of history, no concept of tradition, no concept of what's going before them, and no, no, current, no concern or care about their posterity. 
but even having a posterity. So uh, they're they're really they're they're they've made themselves or accepted being made into subhumans, right? So the new order founded by the the nihilists will be founded on the will to power. The new man, Nietzsche's Superman, right? It's going to have it's going to found his his new world on the will to power. As Dostoevsky points out, pure will is closest to nothing. The most assertive are closest to the most nihilistic. Man is poised on the edge of the abyss, and this abyss, Father Seraphim says. This nothingness of the man who lives without truth, we come to the very heart of nihilism. So section two is called the worship of nothingness, which is what nihil means, it's nothing, right? Very important, the first ten paragraphs, he makes the point that nihilism is revol revolt specifically against the Christian revelation, not against any other faith. So why? Nihilist nothingness is not simply the primal chaos of non-Christian religions. Remember that all the, before, before are apart from God's revelation, through Moses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Man left to his own darkened intellect and demonic influence. Just imagine that matter is eternal. So for all the other religions, the nothingness is, is simply the primal chaos, that stuff is, matter is eternal. That's the, the Darwinist or the evolutionary idea, right? There's, there's nothing, there's never nothing. There's, there's always, matter is eternal. And there's just chaos and then some demiurge or some evolutionary process brings order out of the chaos. Only in the Christian faith is the truth revealed that God, the, the Holy Trinity, the personal triune God, created everything out of nothing. And nihilism gains its demonic fury from assuming that the Christian doctrine of ex nihilo is true. They know it's true. And they want to undo it. Right? They, they, of course, they can't. That's why they're always frustrated. They can't undo it. But they want to undo it. So they're so angry. You know, they're not angry at the Buddhists or the, the poor Hindus or whatever. They're angry at Christ. They're angry at God for revealing this truth that he is the creator and that their being comes from him. And they can't undo their own being or any other being. Nihilism is so powerful because it denies the one and only true religion. Remember the, the saying I've often used, um, uh, corruptio optimi pessima, the corruption of the best is the worst. Nihilism is the corruption specifically of, of the Christian faith. It's apostasy explicitly from the true faith. Not religion in general, but the truth. Okay? So nihilism is not against religion in general, it's against truth. There's a quote from De Maestra on page 69, if, if you want to go back and look in the book, about this. The Christian faith has affirmed the truth more, most clearly and strongly. So nihilism is violently opposed to, or revolts precisely against this truth, the Christian truth, the true truth, the continuous, unalleviated anxiety of the permanent rebel against God comes from his knowing consciously and consciously that he is denying his own being. If you notice that the culture of Hollywood, right, the culture created by the non-Christian element in American society, in Hollywood, journalism, dominating the universities, is always, they're anxious, they're cynical, they're always upset, they're neurotic, they're dark. Why? Because they, they know, consciously and unconsciously, they know that they're denying themselves, they're denying their own being. This kind of person lives in perpetual fear of falling back into the very abyss of non-being that supposedly is his goal because he's a nihilist. He knows deep down that, that his revolt must fail. God is going to win. <laughs> he's already won. Christ has already risen from the dead. And they know this. Uh, the leader, the elite, they know this. And this produces either the paralyzed apathy of the masses or the satanic frenzy of the active power elites, the ones who are in the know. So they're always, they're anxious. They're anxious, they're, anxious, they're cynical, they're dark, they're neurotic. Okay, it's, it's um, who, who defined neurosis? Freud. Who are the people he's living among? People like him, right? The god of nihilism is supposedly nihil, nothing. But actual nothingness, of course, is not possible. It's not attainable. Nothing of what God created will ever return to non-being. Even, we even know this from physics, right? Matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Everything that's been created is already there, and it can't be destroyed. They know they can't destroy it. So the nihilist is perpetually in revolt. He's anxious. He's angry. He cannot attain this goal of non-being, which he simultaneously desires, but he fears because he doesn't want to fall into non-being, and yet that's his, he's driven, right, to this suicidal frenzy. He is fragmented, ever more and more confused, spinning out of control in a centrifugal movement farther and farther from God, yet never escaping God. He can't escape God. You cannot escape God, and you cannot escape yourself. So he's always angry. So he's always lashing out, it's like Lenin signing those death warrants. Kill more people, kill more people, more blood, more blood. Okay. 
The revolution cannot be completed until faith in the true God is uprooted from every heart, but the nihilist cannot escape his unconscious conviction that this true God exists. So his position, his mind, his soul is totally incoherent. It's fragmented. It's always in total chaos. So who are the unhappiest people around? The elites, right? Hollywood, the billionaires, all these people, the elites, they're, suicidal. they're miserable, suicidal, divorce, drugs, on and on and on and on and on and on, right? Because the closer, the more power they get, the closer they are to their God, Satan, and he's eating them up, and they can never appease him. The Christian faith, the truth brings coherence. Everything coheres. Nihilism brings incoherence. No up or down, no right or wrong, true, no true or false, because there's no point of orientation. There's a quote by Nietzsche on page 72. <clears throat> we have killed him, God, you and I. We are all his murderers. This is from a book ironically called The Joyful Wisdom. <laughs> it's, not, it's called The Joyful Wisdom. We have killed him, that is God. You and I, we are all his murderers. But how have we done it? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the whole horizon? What did we do when we loosened this earth from its sun? Whither does it move now? Whither do we move? Away from all suns? Do we not dash on unceasingly? Backwards, sideways, forwards, in all directions? Is there still an above and a below? Do we not stray as through infinite nothingness? Does not empty space breathe upon us? Has it not become colder? Does not night come on continually darker and darker? No up or down, no right or left. He's saying this is what we've done. Now, I think I mentioned uh, a couple of classes ago that Darwin, I think it was in a letter to one of his children or to a friend, where Darwin toward the end of his life reveals that he's depressed all the time because he really came to believe in his theories, which meant that nothing meant anything. Darwin himself says, if, if you believe in what I teach, nothing, religion, art, literature, natural beauty, family ties, anything that man has ever held precious means nothing. There's nothing to orient yourself by. See? No point of, of certainty, no coherence, no stability, nothing. <clears throat> so the real god of nihilism, of course, is not nothing but Satan. And Satan is something. He can't help being something. That's what makes him so angry. Paragraph 11. This is, this is the full paragraph. Nothingness, incoherence, anti-theism, hatred of truth. What we have been discussing in these pages is more than a mere philosophy, more than even a rebellion of man against a god he will no longer serve. It's not just man involved here. A subtle intelligence lies behind these phenomena and on an intricate plan which philosopher and revolutionary alike merely serve and do not command. We have to do with the work of Satan. No, no, no man and no group of men, no conspiracy of men over generations could have thought up all these things that have happened over the past few hundred years. This entire perfect storm, this entire trap to destroy everybody. Only demonic intelligences could have created all these, these ideas, movements, revolutions, so forth and so on. Bakunin, Proudhon, and many avant-garde thinkers, artists, till this very day, right, have openly proclaimed themselves servants of Satan. Now, sometimes they're just showing off. They don't know who Satan is. They don't even really thought about it. But even the silly ones who are just showing off, who don't understand the full import of their words, nevertheless, they're speaking the truth. And when they say things like that, it affects them. Right? And they were nevertheless invoking real demonic energies. And he closes this, this chapter by saying, perhaps now, after all the things that have occurred in our time, he's writing in the 1960s, after all these catastrophes, revolutions, wars, mass murderers, so forth, Maybe now some are beginning to suspect there really are invisible spiritual realities behind our situation. Because in the 1950s, right before he's writing this, is the high point of evolutionary materialism, where you know the establishment claimed to believe in this um, materialist, scientific understanding of everything. And, uh, but the masses are starting to say, wait a second, this doesn't explain, <laughs> this doesn't explain things. And more perceptive people are beginning to realize those, no, just so-called scientific or materialistic explanations can't, cannot explain all this. Uh, it must be something demonic. Uh, one example would be uh, psychiatrists, even, say uh, non-believing psychiatrists who study something like multiple personality disorder. They can't explain it on merely neurological or physiological grounds or environmental grounds. Um, people who study uh, these uh, these sh these uh, apparently senseless shootings where young people go crazy and just kill a bunch of people. Okay. Obviously, there's something spiritual at work. There's something spiritual at work. Um, so we have to 
Well, of course, we know, we're, being orthodox, we know what the answer is. And man has to repent and turn to God. And Solzhenitsyn said it, man has forgotten God. And uh, man has to repent and return to God and the true God. So the mission of the true church is to proclaim the true God and the true way back to God. And just make, call this, all this evil, just call it out for what it is and, t and teach people the truth. It's the only way.